Classical physics developed steadily, starting with Isaac Newton's ideas in the 1600s and progressing through the 17, 18, 1900s. The ideas of forces, gravity, electricity, magnetism, ideas about temperature, thermal physics, light and sound, all of this was being developed and understood. And I think there was a sort of a sense of contentment among the physics community uh, members in the late 1800s that we really had established a scientific method and a scientific framework that could describe the world very deeply and very thoroughly. And there were some inklings in the late 1800s that there was something deep and important missing. And today I want to talk about this transition that was made pretty much right around 1900 from what we now call classical physics to what we now call modern physics. This transition was forced upon us by inconsistencies between theoretical calculations and data that was observed in laboratories. And the first one, or at least the one that I think is perhaps the most influential in the transition from classical to modern thinking, was understood for the first time, or at least tentatively understood, by a fellow named Max Planck. Max Planck was a German physicist who went into college very young. He's a brilliant young fellow. He, uh, he went to college at the age of 16, and in fact, an older professor told him, you shouldn't go into physics, because we pretty much know everything. It's a closed and almost dead field. Fortunately, Max Planck wasn't paying any attention to this old guy, and uh, started studying all of the classical physics that was known, and got very interested in the problem of what happens when objects heat up and they start to glow. It just seems like a ripe topic to put together all of physics. You've got atoms in the material that are jiggling because it's hot, and then you've got to understand electricity and magnetism, because after all, when something glows, what is really going on is there's little electric charges jiggling around, and they emit electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic radiation, which is light. And you need to understand thermodynamics. You really have to put together everything that you know about classical physics. Now, people had been trying to do this for quite some time, and they were discovering a, a, a big disaster. Okay, you would do the calculations following the laws of classical physics and conclude that the color that you would predict is completely wrong. In fact, you get crazy answers. You get infinite answers for the amount of energy being emitted by some glowing object at ordinary, fairly high temperatures. So this was a big puzzle. It was uh, some sort of a dilemma for classical physics. And Max Planck studied the problem, and the first thing that he observed was there was no mistake being made. Classical physics was capable of solving this problem, and you work out the details, and you disagree radically, wildly, with the data. So the next thing that Max Planck decided to do was kind of play the role of Kepler. Remember, Kepler was looking at data describing planetary motion, and his idea was not to explain the motion, but just describe it. That's always the, a good first step in science. Just describe the data quantitatively. So Max Planck sat down, and he looked at the data that had been taken. The data was sort of, you know, when something starts to glow, it's red, and then when it gets hotter, it gets bluish and then whitish. And this was the phenomena that he was really trying to quantitatively describe. And he was able to come up with a formula which described the temperature and color behavior of hot objects. And the formula matched the data, so it seemed to be in agreement with what people were observing in the laboratory, but it had no fundamental explanation. It was simply a description, but not an explanation. So thus began what Max Planck called the most strenuous work of his life. Let me quote from him. The whole procedure was an act of despair because a theoretical interpretation had to be found at any price, no matter how high that must be. You've got to realize this is a very insightful idea in the 1800s when people are quite satisfied with the nature of physics and science. And this guy is saying, look, we've got an irreconcilable difference. We've got to understand it. So he's banging his head against this problem. I, I love this. It's strenuous work, right? Theoretical physics, when you're sitting quietly at your desk thinking, it's really strenuous work. And uh, he did come up with an explanation. And he wasn't completely satisfied with it. But here was his explanation. Now, let me tell you something first about electromagnetic waves. When you jiggle a charge, 
little electric charges make electromagnetic waves which travel away and that's what we call light. So light is a wave. It's a wave like any other wave. Physicists understand waves very well. In the late 1800s, wave mechanics was a very well-developed branch of physics. Imagine poking your finger into a pond and you'll create a wave. So your jiggling finger in the middle of the pond is like a jiggling electric charge and water waves will emanate from that. And we understand how waves behave. Waves are very special things. Waves, for instance, two waves can pass through one another. While they're passing through one another, they interfere with one another, but then they continue on their merry way. Waves can bend around corners. Waves undergo various, they have various properties which are very distinctive. And all of those properties had been experimentally verified to be observed by light rays. Light rays can bend around corners. Light rays can pass through one another. Light rays can interfere with one another. So people really were convinced from the early 1800s on that light is a wave. And there were theoretical arguments that were very, very compelling, that this was a fact of nature. But Max Planck was willing to challenge the scientific framework of the time and said, what if, okay, this is, the, this is his brilliance, what if atoms, little jiggling charges, do not emit electromagnetic waves, but instead emit light in little pulses, little flashes. So we now call those little chunks of light, quanta of light, for individual little bundles of light. Now this is a crazy idea. It doesn't fit in with the theoretical framework of the day, but Max Planck just said, well, what if? And he works out the calculations, and sure enough, his description of this data of hot objects matches with this crazy idea. So he has taken our idea about light and turned it on its head. He says, no, it's not a wave after all. It's a little bundles of particles. So when you look at a light bulb, think of a stream of little BBs of light coming at you. That's the new image of light that Max Planck is proposing. It's in contradiction with data from the early 1800s, but in agreement with this new data. Max Planck got a Nobel Prize for this work in 1918, but he never really believed that what he was describing was fundamentally a statement about nature. He thought that he had discovered a mathematical solution to the problem, a kind of a formal way of thinking about light that wasn't really describing light. Five years later, so that was 1900 when Max Planck published that paper. Five years later, 1905, a young physicist who at the time was barely known. He had his PhD, but he couldn't get a job as a physics professor, so he took a job at the uh, patent office. And uh, he was a smart guy. This was Albert Einstein. And he spent much of his day thinking while he was at the patent office because the patent office work was really pretty easy. And in one year, 1905, Mr. Einstein published three papers. These were refereed physics papers in the journals, even though he didn't have a position at an academic institution. Any one of those three papers was so brilliant and so remarkable that he would be famous today if he'd just written one of them. He would be easily as famous as Max Planck. But he wrote these three papers. It's sometimes called his miracle year. And these three papers were very influential in trends forming our ideas about physics from the classical to the quantum. So let me just briefly summarize. One of them was his paper on the Brownian motion, which I've talked about in the last lecture. It was the quantitative understanding of how atoms bumping into small objects like a little piece of yeast or pollen would make it jiggle around. It was a quantitative demonstration that atoms are real. That was an important and influential paper. Another paper that he wrote that year was his special theory of relativity, for which he is most famous, E equals mc squared and all that good stuff. I would love to tell you about relativity. It's a whole course unto itself, and I'm just going to leave this theory of relativity. You'll have to go learn about it elsewhere on your own. There are lots of resources available. Relativity is tough going. It's kind of counterintuitive, but you can understand relativity without working through very much or even any mathematics. So I would encourage you to learn more. What I want to say about it is simply that special relativity changed our worldview about space and time. Albert Einstein has explained to us in this paper that time and space are intimately connected together. He called it space-time, and this connected fabric 
It's what we live in. It's what physics lives in, the space-time. And it's not the way we had thought for hundreds of years. It's not universal and independent of observer. So this is Einstein's theory of relativity in a super nutshell. And uh, although in principle you need relativity to understand particle physics, which is this course, in practice we can really understand most of what we need to know about particle physics without invoking any of the details of relativity. Um, what I want to focus on today is Albert Einstein's third paper from that year, which was on an effect called the photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect, photo electric. It comes from light and electricity. It was known in the early 1900s that if you shine light on metal, that electricity will come out. And this is extremely well known today, right? Solar panels, light comes in, electricity goes out. Also, you take your little remote control and you click the television set, infrared light hits some detector on the TV set, electricity comes out, gives a signal. Photoelectric effect is useful technology today. At that time, it was a big mystery because people thought that electromagnetic radiation, light, was a wave. So people were picturing a wave, like a wave at the beach, coming up, striking the metal, which is like the beach, and so the pebbles on the beach are like the little electrons, and the wave jiggles the pebbles a little bit. So that's your mental model in classical terms of light hitting metal. And what you would expect classically, you can make a number of predictions based on this worldview. For example, if you have an intense wave, like a tsunami, those pebbles are going to go flying, right? Because there's going to be lots of energy, and so the electrons you would expect coming out from intense light should have lots of energy. And that's not what you see. Completely contradictory data. So it's kind of like Max Planck, who was looking at data from glowing hot objects that was in contradiction with classical ideas. Einstein is looking at data which is contradictory, contradictory to classical ideas. And he said, Let's take Mr. Planck's idea seriously. Okay, let us believe that electromagnetic radiation comes in in the form of little bundles, little quanta of light. So we're imagining now a kind of a pellet storm hitting those pebbles on the beach. And so any one individual pellet of light can hit one pebble and knock it free. And this makes different quantitative predictions, and Einstein worked them all out, and that was his paper. This was the paper for which Einstein got his Nobel Prize, by the way, in 1921. And it's a little bit interesting. Einstein did not get his Nobel Prize for relativity, not for E equals MC squared, not for his understanding of gravity, all the stuff that he's now most famous for, sort of interesting social and political physics politics story, um, which I will leave to you to learn more about because it's sort of fun stuff. So Albert Einstein has taken Max Planck seriously. Max Planck didn't take himself seriously in the sense that he didn't really continue working on this idea of light quanta. But once Einstein weighed in on the topic, people began to take the idea a little bit more seriously. Let me leave light quanta for a moment and talk about another phenomenon which was in gross contradiction to classical ideas at the same era, the late 1800s. People were discovering radiation and radioactivity. In the late 1800s, this was really exciting stuff. It was just so cool to find a little rock that glows or it can expose film. It was almost like magic, but of course it's physics and people were trying to understand it. And it just didn't fit in with the classical worldview. Energy was just coming out of nowhere. It was a crazy phenomenon. And so it got a lot of attention. People were studying radiation and radioactivity like crazy. There was very rapid development of our understanding. From the 1890s, when people first began to observe and measure and understand radiation, to the, say, early 1900s, people began to categorize radiation. Now, you have to name this stuff. Everybody always wants to give a name when you discover something new. And the Greek alphabet was used. So alpha, beta, gamma are the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. So radiation was called alpha radiation, beta radiation, gamma radiation. And uh, nowadays, we've used up the whole Greek alphabet. We'll be talking about that in future lectures. People were trying to understand what this radiation was. And one of the most important early experiments was done by a British physicist named J.J. Thompson, 1897. He had this device. We still use them today. It's basically an evacuated glass sphere or chamber. You've sucked all the air out of it and you put a big high voltage battery with one terminal on one side and the other terminal on the other side and some little rays appear. 
radiation. It's called beta radiation. Sometimes it was called cathode rays because the chemists used to call one of the poles, the negative pole of the battery, the cathode. And the rays seemed to go from the negative side to the positive side. And J.J. Thompson in 1897 did a series of experiments which really pinned down what this beta radiation was. Cathode rays, by the way, is still the name we use if you're looking at your TV set or your computer monitor and you call it a CRT, that's a cathode ray tube. So these things are still in use. It's really cathode rays or beta rays coming from one side to the other and hitting a screen and making it glow. Mr. Thompson did a series of experiments. For example, he put an electric field around his device and watched the beam bend. So that demonstrated that it was electrically charged. Then he put a magnetic field and he watched the beam bend so he could figure out properties of the beam. He could figure out which way it was going and he deduced that the rays were negative particles. They were negatively charged objects. That's negative referring to the electrical charge of the objects. And that they were very, very light. They were 2,000 times lighter than the lightest thing known at the time, which was a hydrogen atom. Remember, atoms are supposed to be indivisible, and the lightest, smallest atom of all, hydrogen, has one unit of mass in some system of measuring weights. And now we found something lighter still by a big factor. So this is a huge puzzle. And J.J. Thompson did lots of measurements and discovered that no matter what you made the tubes out of, no matter what the residual gas was, they were always the same particle, the same electric charge, these little negative electrons that were very light. So these seem to be in everything, no matter what you make the device out of, there's electrons in there. There was other experiments being done uh, at that time. For example, Mr. Röntgen, a German physicist, was looking at what happens when these beta rays hit the end of the device, and then they stop, and then there's something, some other mysterious ray, which have been called variously gamma rays or X-rays. They were truly invisible, and they would travel through the room, but you could detect them with photographic plates. And, for example, if you put your hand in the path of these X-rays, you'll see a shadow image of your hand. Your bones will absorb the X radiation, and the skin will not, and so you see what is now used in medicine at your dentist, just an X-ray. So at that time, we're calling them gamma rays. And all of this stuff was beginning to come into some sort of order, but people really didn't have a deep understanding of where was this stuff coming from? What, is it, what are its origins? One of the big players in this story, uh, Ernest Rutherford, who was born in New Zealand, spent his life in England, uh, formed what is now known as the Rutherford Laboratories, he did a whole long series of measurements over the course of his career. Truly amazing experimentalist. He really was, in some sense, the one who figured out what radiation was, although J.J. Thompson figured out what the beta radiation was. Ernest Rutherford figured out what, for instance, the alpha radiation was. Also little particles, but heavier. In fact, four times heavier than hydrogen. So very, very heavy compared to the beta rays. And positively charged rather than negatively charged. Mr. Rutherford figured out lots of things. He figured out that if alpha radiation was to hit a target like nitrogen, it could change from nitrogen into oxygen. This is a radical idea in the early 1900s, right? That one element, nitrogen, can be converted into another element, oxygen. There is something going on here that is teaching us that atoms are not indivisible after all. They're made up of smaller pieces and they're not immutable, that you can change one to the other. But still, no deep understanding of what the atom really is. So Rutherford, as a brilliant experimentalist, says, look, we've got to figure out what is an atom. So here's his idea. Let's take a source of alpha radiation, just a natural chunk of material like some uranium, and cover it up with lead. So the lead will absorb that alpha radiation, so nothing's coming out, it's just a little bit warm. And now we're going to drill a little hole in one side. So now we've got a little beam of alpha particles that can come out of this thing. So this is the essential ingredient for all physics experiments, particle physics experiments, even today. You need a source and a beam of particles. And now what are we going to do with that beam? Instead of studying the beam, we're going to use the beam as a probe to study atoms. So now we need some atoms. So he took a foil, like silver foil, except he used gold foil. Uh, and the reason you use gold, it's a lovely material to work with. You can make it very, very thin. So you've got a little thin layer of gold atoms. 
And we're going to shine these alpha particles at the gold and ask, what do they do? Now, in general, when you do an experiment like this, you have some idea in advance of what you think is going to happen. So what do you think is going to happen? J.J. Thompson, remember the guy who discovered the electron in 1897, he has an idea which he's published, and he calls it the plum pudding model. I love that. It's the plum pudding model of the atom. So what do we know in the late 1800s, early 1900s about atoms? We know roughly how big they are. They're about 10 to the negative 10th meters in size. All of them are about the same size. We know that they contain electrons inside of them, tiny light objects, which are negatively charged. But we know that atoms themselves are electrically neutral. So there must be some positive charge in there. And Mr. Thompson's plum pudding model was that the positive charge is a schmear. It's spread out over the entire size. That's why the atom is as big as it is, because the positive charge is a goo that's spread out over 10 to the negative 10th meters. So that's the plum pudding model. The plums are the little electrons in there, the little hard nuggets that are very light. And you can knock them out in various experiments. So Mr. Rutherford takes his beam of alpha particles, which he is envisioning as little submicroscopic particles that are very massive, and he runs it into the foil. Now, what would you expect if you took a little BB and you ran it into some plum pudding? Well, what you would expect is it should squoosh through the plum pudding and go pretty much in a straight line, maybe deviate a little bit off to the side. So he sent his graduate students down into the basement. He had set up the source and the target, and then you need a detector. He used some phosphorescent material that when an alpha particle hits it, it flashes a little bit. So these poor students were down in the dark, watching individual flashes, counting them, trying to see what how many particles come through at various angles to verify this theory of J.J. Thompson's. One of those students' name was Geiger, and Geiger is famous for developing the Geiger counter because he got so sick of sitting there counting with his eyeballs that he developed this electronic device to do the counting in later years. Mr. Rutherford was a smart guy. He was a good physicist, probably one of the greatest experimental physicists in history. And one of the things that occurred to him was, maybe this model is wrong, so you guys go down there and look at the alpha particles at all angles. Go out 30 degrees, 40 degrees. In fact, go back behind your gold foil target and just see if anything bounces backwards. Now, that's totally nuts, right? If this stuff is plum pudding, everything's pretty much going to go straight through. But they looked, and they found a few events bouncing backwards. Okay, this is kind of crazy. I have a quote from Ernest Rutherford. It was quite the most incredible event that ever happened to me in my life. It was as if you fired a 15-inch artillery shell at a piece of tissue paper, and it came back and hit you. Okay, it's radical. And this is a man who has essentially discovered radioactive transmutation. I mean, he's done a lot of pretty wild stuff in his career, and to him, this was the most wild event that he'd ever seen. So how can we understand it? Rutherford says, I think, even though J.J. Thompson is, you know, the old senior physicist, brilliant, he discovered the electron, but I think he's wrong. I don't think we're looking at plum pudding here. So what could we be looking at? What's the model of the atom? So Rutherford says, I have a different idea. Supposing that the positive charge, which we know has to be in there, is very concentrated. It's a little dot right in the middle. Massive, that's where the mass of the atom lives. And the electrons are these little super light things that are orbiting around like planets in orbit around the central sun, which is the nucleus. So you've got negative charges in orbit, heavy, massive, point-like nucleus in the middle, and that's the new planetary model of the atom. This is Mr. Rutherford's great idea. And uh, almost immediately people said, well, sorry, Mr. Rutherford, but this just can't be right, because we know classical physics. Classical physics says that if an electron, that's a charged particle, is going around in a circle, orbiting around, any time you have a charged particle going in a circle, it's accelerating around the curve, it's radiating. It radiates electromagnetic waves. And if you radiate away energy, your orbit's going to decay like an old satellite hitting the Earth's atmosphere and spiraling in, ultimately crashing into the Earth. So if atoms were the way Mr. Rutherford had suggested, then you do the calculation and you discover they would disappear. They would disappear in a puff of greasy black smoke within about a microsecond, and there wouldn't be any atoms left. So this model is no good. People didn't know what to do. It was a good model in some respects, but it had this contradiction with classical physics. And along comes a young theoretical student. His name was Niels Bohr. He came from Copenhagen, 
a Danish physicist. The tradition then, as it is now, is that after you get your PhD, you do what's called a postdoc, postdoctoral research. You go for a couple of years to a big name laboratory with some great physicists. You work with them, you learn the ropes, and then if you do well, you can go off and become a professor on your own. So that's what Niels Bohr was doing uh, at the Rutherford Labs. And Niels Bohr said, he's a theorist, so he's trying to interpret this result. And he says, look, we know that classical physics seems to be breaking down in the work of Max Planck and the work of Albert Einstein when we had the interaction of radiation with atoms. Well, here's another case where we've got atoms and maybe classical physics is breaking down. Maybe the interaction of electrons with electromagnetic radiation isn't the classical idea that we've been thinking for so long. So Niels Bohr has a new model. It's the first quantum model. So he's taken the idea of chunks of radiation from Max Planck and from Albert Einstein, and he's now applying it to the world of atoms, trying to understand the structure. So he says maybe the electron's orbits are also quantized. So it's not just radiation. Maybe the planetary orbits that are allowed also come in chunks. And that idea helps to explain why the atom is stable, because you can't just go from one orbit to one slightly smaller. And in fact, it explains lots more data, which was known at the time, of the light which is emitted from, say, hydrogen atoms when you heat them up. Hydrogen atoms glow, and the color of the glow can be understood now from Mr. Bohr's quantum model. So this is a new idea, and once again, it's flying in the face of classical theories. And once again, we have invoked the idea of chunks, quanta, of energy, chunks of matter. It's a, it's a strange idea, and it's not really a very deep or rigorous theory yet. Niels Bohr model, Niels Bohr's model, is just a kind of a description of what we're seeing. Like Kepler, we are describing atoms, but we're not really understanding them yet. People started thinking about these ideas, though. Now we've got lots of evidence, ranging from Planck and Einstein and Bohr and all this radiation phenomenon, that something different is going on. Nature is different. When you get down to the scale of individual atoms, it's not behaving classically like it does when you're throwing tennis balls and cars and bicycles and just ordinary world stuff. Something new is going on. A French prince named Louis de Broglie was working on his physics PhD, and he took this idea so seriously, he said, look, what we seem to be observing is a strange duality. Things are particles, and they're also waves. We can't really picture this. I mean, when I look at a water wave, it's a wave. It's not a bunch of particles. It's really a wave phenomenon. Sound, any wave phenomena that you can think of, is not a bunch of little BBs flying out. So it seems that waves and particles are two contradictory possibilities in the world. You've got to be either one or the other. And people, especially Louis de Broglie, are proposing now a wave-particle duality. That's the buzzword that says we can't quite picture it. It's not a classical idea that you can have a mental model of directly in your brain, but maybe at the quantum level, at the level of tiny things, you can somehow be both and neither at the same time. I wish I could make this more concrete for you. I cannot draw you a picture of something that's a wave and a particle at the same time. You just kind of have to accept this as a crazy but true, experimentally true statement about how little teeny objects are. De Broglie said if it's true for light and the quantum of light, which we now call photons, if light comes in chunks, which are called photons, maybe something else which comes in chunks, like electrons, the little particles that are running around in the atom, maybe those things are also waves. After all, if a wave can be a particle, maybe a particle can be a wave. Once you accept this idea, you kind of have to run with it. It's your obligation to do a what if. So what if electrons are waves? Well, if electrons have a wave nature, think of the wave on a guitar string. If you pluck a guitar string, there are certain frequencies that it can jiggle at, it can jiggle in the fundamental, or it can jiggle at twice the fundamental. There are various modes that the guitar string can vibrate in, but not all possibilities are open to you. You can't just change the frequency of a guitar string a little bit without retuning it, without changing the tension. So de Broglie applied this idea to electrons in an atom and discovered that Mr. Bohr's model was explained, the quantum nature of electron orbits, 
is explained if you believe that electrons are waves. So we're heading towards a theory. It's still not a fundamental theory. There's not a rigorous mathematical framework yet. And in the next lecture, we're going to see now the transition that was made in the 1920s from these primitive ideas of quanta to a more rigorous mathematical framework, which we now call quantum mechanics.